I was sitting at my desk and I noticed a slight pain in my hand. You know how a pain begins and you don't really think much about it? Within 30 minutes, the pain was excruciating. I was absolutely terrified. Well, I started thinking about what I was going to do. I'm a conductor. I use my hands to be expressive, but I also hold my baton between my thumb and finger. I couldn't do it. The pain was excruciating. I did not want to see a medical doctor at that time, and I really don't like to take a lot of drugs. When I went to see the chiropractor, he suggested that he would like to try a light therapy. I had never heard of light therapy. Within 24 hours, the pain had diminished to the point that I had my full range of motion back. To have absolutely no pain in my right hand is absolutely wonderful. Despite the staggering technological advances we've witnessed in the past century, mankind has yet to develop a mechanism as elegant, efficient and complex as the human body. Still, human beings do share an important similarity with the numerous mechanical creations we've engineered to make our lives easier. To function properly, we all need energy. Plants convert sunlight into chemical energy through a process known as photosynthesis. We humans can then consume vegetation as fuel for ourselves. Many alternative healthcare systems characterize the body as being animated by an essential life energy, which goes by many different names. Chi, prana and innate intelligence are all terms used to express this vital life force. Even modern science recognizes the human body as a living electrical system. But how does this organic electricity differ from the power used to fuel toys, tools and technology we've come to rely upon on a daily basis? And how can we harness electrical currents and the energy of light to stimulate our own power to heal? Light in simplest terms is energy. In its most complex terms, it's both a particle and a wave. So it has very interesting properties that you know, we've, as humans, have harnessed over the year to do everything from powering our appliances to helping heal different health problems. Light energy has a special importance in the realm of science fiction and fantasy. In DC's comic book universe, Superman receives his power from rays of our yellow sun. For some time now, we in the Interplanetary Intelligence Department have been greatly concerned over the tremendous scientific discoveries and advancements of the Earth people. In space operas played out in the silver screen, intensely focused beams of light, known as lasers, can be a handy tool in toppling evil galactic empires. Back here on planet Earth, lasers can also have important medical uses, if somewhat less epic. So radiant energy has also been used uh, for lasers. We use that surgically, use it in liposuction. Lasers are also used in the popular corrective eye surgery known as LASIK. But light doesn't need to be focused with laser precision to be an effective tool for healing. It's become really more popular uh, using radiant energy for like dermatological conditions. There's a lot of research out now about using certain kinds of light and radiant energy for treatment of acne and psoriasis and uh, other skin conditions. So there's a whole host of uh, applications that radiant energy has been used for. To the uninitiated, these techniques can appear outwardly unimpressive. Light therapy is deceptively simple. I mean, it looks like nothing's happening, but there is a whole amazing, almost like cosmic machinery of things happening beneath the surface on a cellular level that you can't see happening with the naked eye. While lights may strike many as a benign medical tool, the use of electricity as a means of healing can be more controversial. While electricity has played a role in many safe, effective, even life-saving medical techniques, to some, it sparks a wide variety of negative emotions. The idea of applying high-voltage solutions to the problem of disease invariably conjures up brutal images of a procedure known as electroshock therapy. Electric shock therapy is now known as electroconvulsive therapy, and I think that's actually a more accurate description because the therapeutic part of ECT is the electricity that causes the seizure or convulsion. Undergoing more than just a superficial name change, the technique has apparently come a long way from its snake pit heyday. ECT is a therapeutic use of electricity to cause a seizure or convulsion in a way that has a positive effect on that person's serious mental illness. Since it's so successful for many individuals, people often say, it was like night and day. 
While ECT may be the medical community's most infamous application of electric power, it certainly wasn't the first. In fact, you may find some of the earliest therapeutic uses of electricity to be positively bizarre. People used electric eels and fish to help illness. He thought that lightning was actual electricity, and he was correct. Man's ability to harness electricity has made it possible to create countless mechanisms designed to make living life easier. In the world of medicine, however, important electrical devices have been developed to make saving life easier. Machines like pacemakers or ventilators would be unfeasible without electricity. But even before the power socket became a common household fixture, mankind sought to employ this fantastic, naturally occurring phenomenon as a means of treating ill health. Reportedly in ancient times, um, people used electric eels and fish to help people with headaches and mental illness. While all life forms possess some degree of weak electric charge, other species have developed specialized organs capable of releasing significant amounts of voltage. Electric eels and some species of catfish use this ability to stun their prey when feeding or defending themselves against attack. Ancient Greek physicians had a wholly different use for aquatic life with this unique ability. By some accounts, the torpedo fish or electric ray could be used to treat chronic head pain. Supposedly, iconic philosopher Plato even compared the oration skills of Socrates to the torpedo fish, since it was said he could electrify his audience. While humans can't release electricity as a means of defense, we still have the capacity to carry a charge. There are two aspects of uh, conduction of electricity in the body. One is if I put my hand, touch an AC outlet and uh, get uh, a little bit of juice from there, then the electricity is going to flow over my full, whole body. If I'm touching uh, ground and I'm touching the outlet, then it's going to flow this way. Whatever there's a path to ground, that's where the electricity is going to flow and it's going to flow um, through any parts of my body it can. There's another type of flow which is through the nervous system and that is mostly used by the body to send information from the sensory system back to the brain or control or motor information from the brain back into the muscles and also from the peripheral nervous system back into the muscles. The proper unblocked flow of this internal neural energy has been identified as supremely important in healthcare systems ranging from Ayurveda to chiropractic care. Ayurvedic medicine describes this life energy as prana, while D.D. Palmer, the founder of chiropractic, described it as innate intelligence. But the electric impulses that regulate your body are different from the electricity that powers your blender. So electricity at its most simplest form is the flow of charge. This flow or movement of an electrical charge is known as current. Current is measured as the rate at which a charge passes through a conducting medium, such as a copper wire. The history of electricity goes back thousands of years. Lightning discharge observed by humans, that's electricity. Basically, the clouds accumulate charge, or the ground accumulates charge. And when there's a tremendous difference between one cloud and another in terms of how much charge each one has, there's an imbalance of charge. What happens is, at one point or another, there's enough charge difference that it creates a tunnel, so to speak, between clouds or between the clouds on the ground, that the electric potential ionizes the air and it creates a, kind of like a wire, so to speak, for conduction of electricity. And that's when you have a lightning discharge. The first man credited with storing an electrical charge was a German administrator named Jules Jürgen von Kleist. Von Kleist is said to have made the discovery quite by accident in 1745 while experimenting with a device used to generate static electricity. He connected his device to a jar filled with water capped by a cork with a nail driven through it in an attempt to increase the size of the sparks his machine could generate. 
he was later surprised to find out that after stopping his machine, the nail on top of the jar still held a charge, shocking his hand upon touch. Sadly, the same discovery was made months later independently by a Dutch physicist named Peter van Muschenbroek, who was working at the University of Leiden. As a result, history largely forgot the name von Kleist, and the device became known as a Leiden jar. He created a capacitor. So what happens is if you rub against something that generates that the static electricity, that static electricity could be connected to the electrode of the Leyden jar, and the Leyden jar will hold the charge. Then they put four of those bottles together in parallel, and they created a huge battery. That was the first battery in record. That is relevant for the experiment of Ben Franklin. When not preoccupied with philosophy, music, or international diplomacy, Benjamin Franklin focused on scientific pursuits and was a respected inventor. Franklin had a particular preoccupation with the concept of electricity, and the Leyden jar became an important component in one of his most famous experiments. A bit of American folklore credits Benjamin Franklin with discovering electricity while flying his kite in a thunderstorm. But in reality, Franklin was far too clever to stand in the rain, waiting to be hit by lightning. It's believed by many that the 18th century Renaissance man actually attached the kite to a Leyden jar, released it into a cloud charged with static electricity, and then let Mother Nature do the rest. So when Ben Franklin made the kite experiment, what happened is he put a piece of wire on top of the kite, and at the other end of the string, was a metal key. When it started getting wet and raining, the string got wet and became a conductor. The static electricity from the cloud then traveled down the wet string towards the key, filling the Leyden jar with a charge. He thought that lightning was actual electricity and he was correct. But more importantly, he concluded that electricity can be funneled or channeled and sent into pathways as you choose. That was a very important discovery. But the question remained, where to channel this so-called electric juice and to what end? As it turns out, a number of European scientists and physicians believed that better health was the ultimate promise of this awesome new power. They were fascinated by Ben Franklin's experiment they were interested in electrical therapy for therapeutic purposes.